Okay, here we go. We have George Valdez, uh, who was at one time one of the biggest drug traffickers uh, in the U.S. during the 70s and 80s, but uh, has a very interesting story along the way, especially where he is right now in life. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Vlad. It's a pleasure to be with you. Okay, so this is our first time sitting down, so I want to get into your whole story. So you originally were born in Cuba. Yeah, I was born in a little town called uh, Santiago de Las Vegas, just right outside of Havana, Cuba. And, okay. Yeah, and uh, in 1966, you know, my, my mother was a very, very religious person. My father, you know, he was just your typical uh, Catholic man. He'd take us to Mass and pick us up. But uh, my mother was very adamant that she did not want her children to grow up in a communist regime, you know. So we go to school, and then it's like, God doesn't exist, God doesn't exist, God doesn't exist. We come home, God is everything, God is everything. And if you look at the little towns in Cuba, literally the entire town is all uh, surrounded around the church. So my mother said, no, we're leaving. Uh, my father was one of the wealthiest men in Cuba, so he had no desire. He was 40, did not speak the language. My mother did. And uh, October 11, 1966, early in the morning, she picks us up, and she's like, get up. We're going to uh, Miami. I'm like in shock. I had no idea we we're going anywhere. Just went to bed like every other night. And uh, so I went to pack some things. And she's like, no, 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 just the clothes on your back. So we head to the airport. You know, I'm in a daze. I have no clue what is going on. But we get to the airport. And we're waiting for our name to be called out. And when they called us out, I see my mom and dad go to the counter. And I see my mom coming back crying. And my father like, I'm not going. I'm not going. And my mother is like, she comes up to me and she grabs my hand. She grabs my brother's hand. My brother was nine. I was 10. My sister was six. You know, she was five. And she said, George, take him to Miami. I'll be with you someday. And I'm telling you now, I just, I became like hypnotized. I had no clue what was going on. My world literally shattered. It's like, if the reason we're leaving is because of my mom and she's staying behind, will we ever see her again? You know, all these things go through her mind. So I'm walking to the tarmac because my father's not coming. And as I start to get on the airplane, I see my father coming. And uh, we get to Miami, and it was a shock. We lived in a, in a house that was one square block. We had TV. And all of a sudden, 11 of us are sleeping in a one-bedroom apartment in Little Havana, probably 700 square feet in the floor, writing down one time we're going to piss because everyone had to get up to go to work or go to school. So my world, literally, I say that, I look at my life like in two cataclysmic moments. That was the first one. First decision that I made right off the bat is God's not real. Fidel was right all the time. My mom is just crazy. She has no idea. And, you know, if there is a God, it's going to be me. I'm going to make him out to be. But, you know, we had tremendous principles, tremendous morals. And, uh, and I worked very, very hard. And I went to school. And, you know, I always hated to be second at anything. I used to say the person in second is the first loser. So... I worked very, very hard, went to school. My mother came in 1969 at the end, in 1966, towards the end of uh, the year. And uh, things got a little better for us, but then she was very, very sick. She had thyroid problem. They thought first she had throat cancer. So we, uh, we literally went without food. We went without anything. I remember my dad, I remember one time, all we would get for breakfast would be just a glass of milk with this powdered milk from Vietnam. So today I can drink no milk. And it would not mix. And my dad would throw in two raw eggs, and that was it. That was our food till nighttime. And not much at night. Well, I just want to touch on something before we get off this topic. Uh, Castro took over Cuba in 1959. Correct. And you moved in 1966. Correct. Now, you were, you were 10 years old, so I know you don't remember a ton of everything, but what exactly was happening when Castro took over Cuba and started you know, establishing the whole communist regime and so forth there? You know, the interesting thing for us as little kids, we didn't know much, right? Because we went to school, and school, every kid in, the thing in Cuba was that every kid went to the same school. So there was no kids in private school, public school, better school. I mean, all the schools were identically the same. To us, our life had not changed much because at the beginning of the revolution, things did not change drastically. Uh, and if they did, I didn't notice as a kid. We still had our cars. We went to the beach. And uh, my mother applied in 1962 to leave. But because we were very wealthy, we didn't even get to go to 1966. I mean, literally, they inventory your entire house. If you were missing a spoon, you were not going. 
So for us, school was a happy moment, and we a lot of uh, uh, he stressed a lot of important in sports. You know, in Cuba, you had to swim before first grade. Otherwise, I think your parents go to jail. And uh, you know, I was a great athlete. I was a great ball player. In the block where I lived, lived the best baseball player in the history of Cuba. And uh, I remember him coming out before going to the park and playing with us on the streets. And then sometimes taking us to the park. So life for me was, couldn't tell no different in Cuba prior to Castro, which I would have been four, and then when I left. Got it. Okay, so now you're growing up in the United States, uh, in Miami, and you're living in Little Havana, right? Correct. And you end up in the University of Miami. And while you're there, you want to actually get into accounting. Right. Well, it even goes before that. So in 69, we were really struggling, couldn't make it. So my mother said, we're going to move to New Jersey. And so we packed and we moved to New Jersey, went to live in Jersey City. I, again, lived in the ghetto of the ghetto. Uh, but I went to Hudson Catholic and I was, you know, a straight A student. And then in 72, we decided we want to move back to Miami. My parents had saved enough money to buy a little bitty house. And I came. I mean, Cuba just can't stand the cold weather. So we had to leave. So we came uh, to Miami, and a friend of my dad worked for the Federal Reserve Bank. And uh, he knew that I was really good in accounting. So he went up to the uh, vice president there and said, listen, I got this kid. He's really sharp, 17 years old, honest, doesn't do drugs, doesn't smoke, perfect record. Uh, he'd be a great employee. And I went to work for them in 1973. You know, I just turned 17 years old. I was the youngest employee in the history of the Federal Reserve Bank at the age of 17. And at the same time, I was working full time and going to University of Miami full time because that's what our generation did, right? I mean, our generation, most of my, like I tell my kids, listen, if you work really hard today, you have so much of an advantage because my generation, we work full time. And a lot of us were executives, bank executives, uh, worked for a big corporation, went to school at night. We went to get our degree full time. So my life for four years was just the same. I can tell you hour for hour what I did from Monday through Monday from 1976, I mean, from 1973 to 1976. Okay, so you're going to school and you have a professor named Jack Snay. Yes. And he had an accounting business, but he didn't speak any Spanish. So he had you start handling some of his Spanish clients. Right, so he come up to and me and he said, George, I was the number one student in his class. He said, you know, I think that you want to go into business by yourself. He uh, was a partner at Price and Waterhouse, moved to Miami didn't speak Spanish. I said that uh, he didn't speak the language of heaven. So he uh, said, if you do my Spanish clients, I will give you an office, secretary, copy machine, everything you want to start your own business. And to me, that was like heaven opened up. You know, it was the first time anybody ever did anything for me. And I felt, you know, my dad didn't want me to leave the bank. He thought I had a great career, which I did. Uh, and, uh, but my mother was like, you know, we're never gonna get nowhere working for somebody. So you need to go work for yourself if that's what you want. And I did, and I left, and I went to work for Jack, uh, literally as my own accounting office, and he was, I was subcontracting his Spanish clients. Okay, and one of your first clients was a, a little grocery store called La Puerta del Sol. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> so now, get this scenario. So I had the same girlfriend for three years. If I ever went to a party, and I saw anyone smoking marijuana, which was very, very prevalent in the, in the mid-70s, I would leave. And my girlfriend was like, well, you don't smoke it, why are we leaving? I work for the Federal Reserve Bank. I can't be around any of those people. I'm going somewhere in life. I mean, my whole goal was, I'm gonna graduate from Miami at 20, I'm gonna go to law school, I'm gonna graduate by 24, and by the age of 30, I'm gonna be a millionaire. That was literally my game plan since the day I came uh, from Cuba. So I was just focused on that. Didn't go to parties, never did drugs. All the alcohol in my life that I drank fit in a teacup. So I was like, I mean, when you think about a nerd, if there's a picture of a nerd in the internet and in the encyclopedia being my picture. That's how it was. So imagine I walk into this little grocery store, you know, and imagine it's about 30 feet wide by maybe 70 feet long. You know, your typical uh, shopping center, strip shopping centers. I need to clarify that because people I say strip and because of my accent, people think I'm talking about a strip joint. So it was just one of those strip stores and I went to work for them and uh, it was quite an experience. Well, La Puerta del Sol was the original drug front for the Medellin drug cartel. Yeah, as a matter of fact, so I'll reveal this on your TV. 
there was no Medellin drug cartel. So that's something that is really interesting. No one's ever talked about this. Uh, that was a name that the Americans gave us because we were about, originally, well, well let me start then with La Puerta Sol. So the Puerta Sol, when I go there, the first Monday, they walk me to the back. Now, this is 1976. And uh, I had a little office, and I see this paper bag, and it had $100,000. And I'm like, what the hell? Impossible that this store makes so much money. Come back next week. It didn't say nothing. Very naive. Come back next week, $75,000. Now, I'm beginning to wonder, like, really, what's going on here? Never even crossed my mind that these people were drug dealers. Finally, the third week, when I showed up, and there was like 110, I'm like, no, I got to talk to this guy. So I called the owner. And I'm like, Albro, oh, come here. Man. You know, you buy a can of soup for a dollar, and I'm looking at a can of soup over there that's been in the shelf for about 10 years because it's got dust all over it. I said, and you sell it for $3, you make $2 profit. In the last three weeks, I've counted almost 300 grand. That means you must have spent at least 100,000, but I counted everything you bought, and it's like 1,400 bucks. How are you doing this? And uh, he said, I, I, I tell people when I speak, listen, I didn't know nothing about Jesus multiplying the fish and the uh, and the bread, if I did, I would say he had nothing on this Colombian man because they didn't have nothing and they were making millions. He said, he looked at me straight in the eye and says, well, yeah, that's, we're drug dealers. And I'm like, you know what? He said, yeah, we sell cocaine. And I tell people, you know, I was shocked. I was shocked for about 10 seconds because that's how quickly he came to tell me that, hey, as long as you don't bring the law, as long as you don't do anything with drugs, and, you know, we need to go back to 76. It was a different stigma, right? D I mean, cocaine was not even on the DEA radar because who consumed cocaine? The rich and famous. You know, it didn't get down, trickle down to like it is today. So when you're selling a kilo of cocaine for 70000 and a house in Miami, a great, good-looking, you know, middle class, four bedroom, three bath, is 20000 who can afford that, right? So it was for the rich and famous, the Hollywood celebrity. And uh, when I looked at him and he's like, you know, you work for the Federal Reserve Bank, right? And I said, yeah. He said, don't you know how to open bank accounts, foreign bank accounts? And I'm like, well, I happen to do. And he's like, well, we can't take our money back to Colombia because of currency restrictions. So we like to open foreign bank accounts to, put our to save our money. And uh, he said, how much? Now, I had no clue what it would cost. All I knew is that roughly there was an attorney in Grand Cayman because we did a, an audit at the Federal Reserve Bank of a bank that had a daisy chain going. And we knew that the reason, the way they were paying the loan in Miami when it became due was through a loan in Grand Cayman through a you know, number of companies. So I'm like, it's about $10,000. And he's like, well, good, I won three. And I was shocked. I'm like, what? I knew it cost about 700 bucks. I said that just to get him out of my head. I didn't even know why. And I'm like, so I'm acting like this big tough guy. I'm just 21 years old. I mean, well, not even 21 years old. And uh, he's like, just take all that money that we had this week, open us three accounts. So I went and I opened three accounts for them and made 28000 Now, imagine, I'm working for the First Year Bank. I got a big, big government salary, and I'm making three seventy five an hour. You know, when the minimum wage was, I think, $0.90. Cents. So all of a sudden, I made 28000 and I tell people, you know, it's like my world began to change. Because all of now, here I am, I'm my circle of influence is different, right? Now I'm hanging out with people who have money, you know, uh, people of influence. And uh, it took about three months when they began to say, listen, we really want you to handle all of our operations in the U.S. Even though you guys weren't calling it the Median Drug Cartel, uh, that's essentially who they were doing business with, right? Well, actually, this group, this group was composed of four people and me. This group was a group that became known as the Median Drug Cartel. Because the Medellin Drug Cartel didn't get his name until 1980. We're in 1976. We were way before even Pablo Escobar even surfaced. We were selling 500 kilos of cocaine in 1977 when nobody even knew literally what cocaine was. I mean, we're doing $100 million a month. So out of our group, really out of the head of the group, Manuel Garcia, who I consider my godfather, and uh, out of him, then in Medellin, started to surface different groups, like Pablo Escobar, Yoshua Brothers, you know, uh, Gacha, and really a, a couple of the guys that no one has ever, ever mentioned that was probably even bigger than them. See, we know about Pablo because how notorious he became. But in reality, all the money he said that he made and all the billions and trillions, listen, if you, if you listen to my indictment, they think I made a trillion dollars. And uh, 
It's a bit exaggerated. I mean, we made a lot of money, don't get me wrong. 